You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Deborah Senefelder. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. We've got a great show lined up for you today. Before we get started, I'd like to thank some sponsors for making the show possible. Patricia Gillum, World Gone Red, her new short story, Heroes of Corvus, book two, a sequel to A Superhero's Duty. Daniel Spires reveals to his team and Icarus that someone has been mass abducting the children of modern heroes and villains around the world. Icarus searches for answers while dealing with the physical aftermath of his encounter with Hellstorm. His powers are fading, and a compromised hero may cost him his life. This is an excellent new series from Patricia Gillum. There's going to be more coming soon. Stay tuned for it. Get in on the series while it's unfolding. Patricia Gillum, World Gone Red, Heroes of Corvus, Book 2. I'd also like to thank Richard Fox and his Ember War Saga. Guys, if you love science fiction the way I do, you must read the Ember War Saga. Nine books uh, with several spinoffs, uh, lots of great stuff going on in the Ember War. This one, and if you love audio, let me tell you, Luke Daniels narrates the audio for this series, and it is absolutely amazing. We're going to be talking about the Ember War Saga more in coming episodes, but uh, go check it out on Amazon The Ember War Saga by Richard Fox. Now on to our great show. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Deborah Senefelder on the show with me today. She has a fantastic new book called The Hidden Corpse, a food blogger mystery book two, the second in the series. Uh, Welcome to the show, Deborah. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. I'm excited to have you. Um, We begin the show each time with the same question. And that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? I've been thinking about that question, and it's really hard to pinpoint an exact time. It just seems like I've always written stories, um, short stories, mostly in school, and then just graduated on to trying to write novels. So I just think I've always been doing it. Yeah. I, I think that's it's the case for a lot of people is yeah. that it's just one of those things that you can't put your finger on uh, of when it began. Uh, when when do you think that it, it became that you became aware of it? Uh, that that maybe the first time somebody commented uh, on a story that you had written, or uh, do you have a memory like that? I think probably when I was in my late teens, early 20s, I realized that I wanted to be a novelist. Um, I grew I grew up on Nancy Drew books, and then I graduated to Agatha Christie, the Miss Marple series. Oh, but yeah. then I got into Jackie Collins and Danielle Steele, and at that point, they were on TV all the time doing interviews, and yeah, I wanted their life. I wanted to do what they were doing. <laughs> And, um, yeah, it was so glamorous. Yeah. Really not. <laughs> really. <laughs> not. Yeah. But I think that was the first time I really made the decision or admitted to myself that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a novelist. That's wonderful. Um, you you said you grew up on, on Nancy Drew and then yeah. uh, and Agatha Christie. Uh, what was that initial draw for you for mystery stories, do you think? I just I the element of surprise, the element of not knowing um the puzzle. Um because one of the first stories I ever wrote was in school and it was called The Silent Woods and it was about um campers out in the woods and there was a serial killer. I have no idea where that came from. I was only I was a Girl Scout because I wasn't allowed to go camping with my Girl Scout troop because my parents didn't want me going into the woods. <laughs> We're from the city and they didn't want that. <laughs> and I think that's where it drew out of. I have no idea where it came from. Probably a Nancy Drew book, but just taken to the extreme. Oh, that's so that's so great. <laughs> um, do you, were there uh, from Agatha Christie, um, then to Danielle Steele, um, yeah, and, and and Jackie Collins? What was yeah. the? Um, how did those things start? 
combining and and merging and melding uh, into uh, d- like what what were the the how did the influences start changing the way you uh, saw stories? I think. Um I don't know. Just the complexity of the character, especially when you, I was look, reading a Daniel Steele or Jackie Collins at that time, the larger than life, the the dramas. And also, too, I had a heavy influence of TV and I grew up on soap operas and um, I just love pop culture. So that was always an influence. So I just love characters, the dramas, the the conflicts between them. And then you add in mysteries. And then I just fell in love with some cozy mysteries that I discovered when I moved to Connecticut, our local bookshop had a wall of all these um, mysteries. I didn't realize that there were cozy mysteries. I didn't know what that was at the time, but the ones that drew me were culinary cozy mysteries. Um, Catherine Hall Page, Joanne Pence, um, Joanne Fluke. I started reading those books, and they spoke to me, especially the Catherine Hall Page, because her character is very similar to my own life at the time, from New York City to rural Connecticut, small town. Um, I enjoyed cooking. So I was very much out of my element here, like her main character was. So that just drew me. And those are the stories that I started to want to write. Well, let's let's break that down for people, um, because some of the the uh, the sub genres, um, if, if you're not an active reader on those, people mm-hmm. don't understand the um the particulars of it. So first, what what makes a mystery a cozy mystery? Cozy mysteries are usually um, set in a small town. They can be in a larger city, but then it would be in a small neighborhood. Um, there's a returning cast of characters in each book in the cozy mystery series. And usually the violence is off the page. Um, you usually will not... Um, be in the, the killer's head during a murder scene. There's no real violence. There is no real foul language in these books. Um, so that's what does differentiate them from other mysteries. So then we break that down further to culinary cozy mysteries. Yes. What, what brings that element in? Well, and that's usually when the main character is in some type of food profession, like a baker or a private chef or in my case, a food blogger, or they can be a food writer. Um, There's restaurant owners. So it's very narrow. That's what the book revolves around, the food. Gotcha, gotcha. So you start picking up these influences and and things that you uh, really connect with. Um, When you said that uh, late or or sometime in your teens, you started realizing that you wanted to be a novelist, that this was was a, a, a career you wanted to pursue. So what do you do to make that happen at that time? Well, then I went to fashion school at of that course, time. Of course, of course. That's that's the natural progression. <laughs> right, right. Because, yeah, I, you know, even though I wanted to be a novelist, I didn't think I could actually make a living at it. And um, so, yeah, I had, you know, I wanted to study fashion. I wanted to actually major in my hobby at the time, so I did. And, you know, I went to work in retail and then eventually moved up to Connecticut where I went to work for a, non, um, a nonfiction publisher. So... Yeah, that's the path you take to be a novelist. Oh yeah, yeah, and and every everybody has, or almost everybody has, this circuitous path that uh, that brings us to the the craft. Um, yeah. And and a lot of times, if you just look at it on the surface, you're like, this makes no sense. Why, why would being a fashion, uh, you know, buyer have anything to do with writing culinary cozy mysteries? Uh, but looking back, you can see the the points connecting. Um, and and I love to explore the intersection of of artistic expressions, and, and I think fashion is is absolutely an, an artistic expression. Um, how do you feel like that time working on on that side? Uh, has affected uh, your writing or the maybe the way you see the world, the way you explain it to people? Do you see a connection there? You know, I think the time that I spent um, in fashion school then working in retail really helped with the second series that I sold um, in 2018, 2017, actually, because um, that revolves around fashion, where um, the Food Blogger Mystery Series comes from is some this comes from the time that I worked as a food blogger. I had my own food blog for several years. I got into blogging um, probably around 2010. 
And then I eventually started a food blog and I worked on that for a few years. And then I realized that I really wanted to be a, a, a fiction writer rather than a blogger. So I used my experience from food blogging to write the food blogger mystery series. So there was that, there was that little time where, you know, I, I pursued writing after I moved up to Connecticut. I connected with other fiction authors here. And, you know, after several years of not getting, of several years of rejections, of things being critiqued to death, I mean, how many times can you hit your head against the wall? Um, I just found blogging was a really freeing thing to do. Nobody told me what to write, how to write it, when to write it. I just wrote it. And I think I needed that time away. So what year would uh, did you start blogging? Probably around 2010, or 2000, 2009, 2010. Yeah. So really at, at the peak of, of blogging when it was really yeah. hot. Um, I, I really lament that uh, that so many bloggers have have uh, you know taken to Facebook and 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 Instagram to to put their longer stuff. I I, I mm. really love the idea of, of a of a writer kind of owning their space and uh, and, and having a place to to, to visit and, and kind of see the journey of the writer there. Um, I, and I, I still love the idea of blogging, and I think more people ought to ought to do it. Um, what was the uh, so you, you you wanted to just start uh, sharing things and, and expressing uh, things. What mm-hmm. was when did you realize that uh, that blogging um, was was something that that scratched an itch for you? When did you start finding your place in the in the blogging community? Oh, right away. Um, I first began a very small blog on this other platform that allowed users to have their own blogs. So that's how I got into blogging. and I tested it out and I really enjoyed it. Then I just started seeing that I could have something on, on Blogspot at the time. It was, it was Blogspot and WordPress. So I moved over. Then I finally you know, decided to get my own domain and I created it was the cookbook diva that i i created nice. and yeah and um so i was i was writing about reviews on cookbooks and doing my own recipes and um i enjoyed it i really did because and then i just you know put my whole heart into that blog for that period of time i didn't write fiction um because you can't between working full-time writing a blog which is an enormous amount of work and then writing it was just too much and, but that got the itch to go back to fiction writing. I just, I missed it. I still kept my hand in the writing community, but I wasn't actively writing. And um, I slowly got back into writing fiction and I got a critique partner and we were working together on, on manuscripts. I had written about three romantic suspense novels, but they just weren't right. I didn't feel that they were right for me. Something was missing. And then I had the idea about a cozy mystery with a food blogger. I started writing it. I sent it to my critique partner. She read the first three chapters and she says, go for it. And then eventually I had to shut down my food blog because I just felt that I couldn't spend time, again, working full time, blogging and writing a novel. Right. right. Can't do everything. When you were writing the blog, did... um you know, when you're reviewing cookbooks and things like that, um, mm-hmm. did did you see that that other parts of you were uh, were, were bleeding into uh, the blogging? And did you did did people start uh, realizing your character coming out? And uh, you know, that's what we love about bloggers. It's not that that we just uh, get a, a dry review. It's that we get right. you know pieces of her life and 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 commentary that makes us laugh or. You know, think, did did you did you get satisfaction in that way that there was pieces of you coming out in that writing, even though it wasn't the specific writing that you always wanted to do? Right, it, I did. I enjoyed it because I would I um I made the recipes. I didn't just review the book. I actually cooked the recipes and I photographed the recipes and I put them up there and I shared you know my feelings about the recipes and you know what I made for dinner that night or you know what I had for brunch and it was satisfying but it came to a point where I realized that I didn't want to be reviewing cookbooks and I also shared my own recipes on the on the blog too and I wrote about my own life you know life here in Connecticut life with my dogs and stuff but I didn't want to always 
I didn't want to be reviewing other people's books for the rest of my life. I wanted to be writing the books. So, and that's. Okay. And I'm sorry, I'm, I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm sorry. It's okay. Oh, and that's just when I realized that um, the fiction writing was missing from my life. So when you put that on hold and and decided to uh, to try your hand at the mystery again, was it uh, was it like a, an aha moment? Like this, this is what I've been looking for. Did it give you that that satisfaction? And uh, did it feel like you were back on the right path? Yes, it did. How, right how, how long did it take you to write that first book? I started it in summer of 2015. And then by April of 2016, I had already submitted it to an agent and was signed on by an agent. So about a year. Gotcha. Um, so tell us uh, about that book. What was the what was the catalyst that got it started? And, and um, was it a character that came to you first? Was it a, a scenario? Like when when a when a new idea comes to you, what does it usually come as? Well, so. The main character came to me first, um, Hope Early. She's the food blogger. And she was a character that I had in a book years and years ago that I wrote. And um, I really liked her. And so I dusted her off, gave her a new name, gave her a new career. Um, And then I kind of paired it with the one thing that I probably hate the most doing, and that's gardening. So <laughs> I think that's why their murder scene, the first murder scene is set in the garden tour. So, um, and then it just all starts Subtle. coming together. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I work out my issues, but I just, everything just starts building. As soon as she, you know, she was formed, everyone else around her just starts coming to me. So, and that's how it works oh that's fantastic um so what was your your path to getting that book out to the world well um i submitted it i submitted a query then a partial to an agent i I signed on with an agent and then we began the submission process and by the tuesday after thanksgiving that year was it 2016 yeah i got a three book offer from kensington nice and and what was that first book that was uh that was published the uninvited corpse gotcha the uninvited corpse um you have also written um besides the food blogger mysteries um uh, you also have another series the uh a resale boutique mystery series yes um what was the what was the idea that got that started that started from a short story that I wrote several years ago that I tried submitting to an anthology but kept getting rejected. So I decided, well, just try and make it a whole book since the short story wasn't working. And um, yeah, I created the main character, Kelly Quinn, out of work fashionista who inherits an old tired consignment shop. You know, of course. And um, yeah, I, cre- I started writing that. I wrote up a partial, sent it to my agent, and then October of 2017, I got another three book contract from Kensington for that series. Do you like taking these uh, these situations and scenarios that you have found yourself in, and then kind of playing what if, uh, you know, uh, and 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 running scenarios out uh, to to fun places? Uh, it, it it seems like you know the food blogger, uh, the retail boutique. Yeah. Uh, this is kind of a, a fun way to. Uh, to to work out those uh, uh, workplace fantasies and, and uh, mm-hmm. take care of people that annoy you and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it, you know, it really does. It does help, you know. Ha- you know, you hear that I was saying, write what you know. Um, in this case, it is very helpful because um, I'm able to write about two areas, two professions that I had experience in. Um, but it is fun, um, and I have other ideas for other for other books that I really have no personal experience with. But that's that would be a different challenge and fun to do also. So, right, right. Um, this is um, um, the, the cozy mysteries are so much fun because you can – it's it's kind of guilt free reading. Um, it's it's mm-hmm. kind of the best of of what excites us about solving puzzles and and things like that without having to get gory and uh, and you know just having your brain hurt at the end of a of a deep mm-hmm. psychological thriller. Um, what what do you hope people um, get from your books um, when when they have finished one? 
I hope that with the finished reading one of my books that they've had a good reading experience, that they got to visit with characters that they would want to meet up with again, and that they maybe learned something, because that's one of the things I found about Cozy Readers. Uh, you, um, they enjoy learning new things, and you'll see that in the Cozy genre. We have... Um, glass blowers and you have um, newspaper reporters and you have knitters and quilters and needle pointers and you get to learn something I know I do after I finish reading um, you know when a book about um, a restaurant owner I get to learn how the, the restaurant industry is there's a little glimpse into it so it is it's nice so I, that's I just hope that when they're done that they've had a good experience and that they are not bogged down by, you know, as you said, <laughs> the gory details of some of the other suspense novels. Right. Um, what what things about being a food blogger do you get to inject into your stories? And, and what might surprise people uh, that they'll learn uh, about that whole uh, subgenre? Oh, wow. Um, there's so much to put in there for about food blogging. And I try to sprinkle in not too much because a lot of it is just... You know, Google Analytics, um, a lot of technical stuff, um, but, you know, photography, it is it's very time consuming. I found the photography part the most time consuming. I am still not a good for t- food photographer, not even close. Um, and the amount of photographs you have to take for one decent one. Right. <laughs> It was just outrageous. I, I, I do not, I do not have the patience for that. I, and in fact, in the Hidden Corpse, Hope is taking a food, uh, food photography course, and I'm so jealous that she took that <laughs> course because it's something that I've always wanted to do. And um, yeah, it's there is just so much little things. The amount of time that you have to put into creating that blog post it, and the recipe, the recipe testing. You know, it's not just one or two tries. It's multiple times that you should be trying the recipe before you ever publish it. So, um, yeah, it's a lot. Well, what did food photographers do before digital photography? When you when you took a photo and then you had to wait a week to have it developed and then see if it's any good. Uh, uh, that would have been terrible for blogging. <laughs> I know, exactly. I can't, oh my goodness. I, I cringe after I take like 50 photographs of one cupcake and I load it up here because I still will put some photographs online for some of the things that I make, but not too often because of the amount of work. But yeah, I'll take like 50, 60 pictures and they're they're all horrible. (laughs) Let's talk about Hope Early, your your protagonist in the series. She's a former reality TV baking show contestant Mm. at Recent Divorcee. Um, did, Did Hope come to you fully formed? Or um, did you discover all these things about her? Probably half and half. You know, I knew that she, um, I knew that she had been in New York City for since college and that she worked in the magazine industry. And I don't know when I added in the reality baking show competition. I'm not sure when that came into play, but it's like 50-50. You know, I knew that, you know, she had a sister. And then those little nuances came in about her life, about her personality, about the farmhouse that she purchased, you know, and about all the about the chickens. The chickens just came out of nowhere, I think, one day. And, um, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's evolving, you know. Um, I, I love the, the tagline that you, you got. Uh, Hope is trying to find her recipe for success as a food <laughs> blogger, but murder keeps getting in the mix, uh, which is yeah. hilarious. Um, it, you know, um, I, I talked to someone one time and we were talking about the, the old TV show uh, Murder, She Wrote. Oh, and, yes. And, uh, you know, it's, which another great cozy mystery yes. uh, series. But, um, you know, it Jessica, um, the, the main character, um, if you had someone like her living in your small town and 400 people get murdered around her, you know, just this week after week, you would start wondering if she is a serial killer herself. Um, how do you, how do you balance, uh, writing a series, uh, a cozy mystery <laughs> like this? And you've got this great character in, in hope. Um, but you know, without, uh, where she keeps finding herself in these strange situations. Um, and how do you keep putting her in the midst of things and, and keep readers engaged? I know that is a struggle because how many people can you kill in a small town? <laughs> right. I think I'd be putting my house up for sale. Um, 
I do have plans to take Hope on the road. Um, oh, that would be fun. Yeah, you know, to, to just take her and a few of the characters out of Jeff- the town she lives in. It's called Jefferson, Connecticut. It's fictional. Um, to remove her from the town. Um, that is a plan because you you, know, you just can't keep killing everybody in town. And um, yeah, it is. It's hard. But, you know, there is a suspension of disbelief in you know, cozy mysteries. So we allow for that. Sure, sure. <laughs> Um, when you're uh, when you're tackling a new project, so the hidden corpse, mm. um, do you do you know the ending from the beginning, uh, and, and are you an outliner or uh, are, are you a discovery writer? How does the story unfold for you? I first, I am an outliner. My outlines tend to be twenty to twenty five pages long, um, so they're very detailed. That's very detailed. Yeah. Yes. Um, I begin with who the victim is, the first murder victim, and then I brainstorm ideas of how and why, and that why usually lead me to who. So I, I do know when I begin, when I sit down to write the first draft, who the victims are and who the murderer is. Gotcha. Um, so then uh, if you're building that detailed of an outline, uh, how do you start fleshing out that, that roadmap? Well, first I begin with, and actually I'm doing that right now for um, my third resale boutique mystery. What I have are, you know, the basic plot points um, I go through. I follow uh, Michael Haig's um, plotting outline. So I start there, you know, building from just one or two sentences for the different turning points of the story. You know, um, when I begin with an ordinary world and I take it down to a new situation, I just follow through with one or two sentences. And then I take that and I expand on each um, um, plot point. And from there, I usually have one sheet with just very limited information. And then I begin my full outline and I just start brainstorming, you know, um, what the scenes are going to look like, you know, it becomes very detailed and it just, it's a building. It takes about a month to outline a manuscript for me. About how long? About a month to outline. About a month. Okay. Completely. Gotcha. Um, and, and how, how much time are you spending per day uh, in that outlining world? Oh, oh, several hours. It's really, you know, I don't really time it, but it's several hours a day when I'm working on it. And even when I'm not at my desk, I'm still thinking about it. And then I, when that's all done, it can take, you know, as I said, about a month to outline completely. And then I begin the first draft. And I can usually finish a first draft in, in a month because I have my outline. And I just, every day my goal is 3,000 words. And I just start working until I get to the end of the first draft. And, and having that detailed outline um, that for, for your process, it sounds like that that uh, uh, when you show up each day to do the writing, you've got the, the decisions and the hard parts already done. You just get to add all the, the fun stuff that the characters yes. do on a whim. Yes. Yes. Do, do you find that that it leaves you room to still be creative, uh, even though you have such a detailed outline uh does you know that and that's that's the main complaint that non uh outliners have is that well you know you've you've done all the work for the book already it's like you've already written it uh and it's it's kind of mechanical at that point do you find that to be true or do you do you still find that there's plenty of of creativity left in the process no i find that there's still creativity left in the process i mean you can even argue that my first my outline is really a mini first draft of the manuscript because it is so detailed when i and this happened when i think when i wrote the hidden corpse i had this one whole scene outlined in my outline and when i wrote it it just fell flat it was just it just wasn't working it really didn't move the story forward so i just stepped away from the computer for a few hours, thought about it, and came back and scrapped that scene, and I came up with something else. So there is still things that I add to it, and even when I finish my first draft, um, it's still short for word count because it's not fully fleshed out. You know that comes in the second draft. So your second draft, um, you're you're not having to rethink major decisions because you've already made those decisions, but you're getting to go in and just 
add more more muscle and flesh to the skeleton and and, yes. and, and maybe maybe bring a sharper point to certain yes. scenes so what things do you look for like if you're if you say okay I'm going into the second draft now and and I'm about I don't know I'm just pulling a number out of out mm-hmm. of the air uh, 20,000 words to this manuscript mm-hmm. where do you start looking for places that can be expanded and and beefed up a little bit a lot of it is description okay um, yeah, that's why I find that I'm adding in a lot. And um, description of place, of character, because everything is very, you know, he said, she said at that point in my first draft. It's very dry like that. Um, I can add in more um, narrative into a scene. Um, I can get deeper into the character's head. So there is a lot that I do flush out, but it's all, as you said, it's like a fine point at that, at that stage. And then it goes to my critique partner. And when I get her feedback, I just go in for the final polish before I send it to my editor. Nice. That's uh, uh, I love when people have a very specific workflow and they they found what works for them. It makes me makes me so happy. Um, mm-hmm. I just I, I love the idea of 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 uh, of how that works. Um, when you um, do you, do you ever have the temptation to deviate from from that outline and do do better ideas ever come to you in the writing? Oh, I will deviate. I mean, as I said, that one scene that was just one example when I did scrap and I changed it, and I was very happy with the change. It worked. So yes, I don't lock myself into the outline, but I can't imagine actually writing the book without the outline. And I tr- I do say tr- true to it ninety percent of the time. Got gotcha. you. What is your? You said you you have a a, a three thousand word goal per day. Um, are, are you a morning writer? Do you, do you uh, do you have a set time that you show up and and do you hold your your writing space as sacred? Do you, do you have to be at the same place every day? Um, I do work in my. I have a home office uh, that I work in. That's typically where I am, and I don't like working when there's in, in like a coffee shop or anything like that. N- noise distraction. I that doesn't work for me, and I typically am a morning writer. I try to get my the words done first thing in the morning, and that leaves me the rest of the day to do everything else: the marketing, promotion, newsletter, things like that. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, the the new book is called The Hidden Corpse. It's Food mm-hmm. Blogger Mystery Book 2. It's out available everywhere when people are hearing this. Um, Deborah, do you see this? Uh, you said you're working on a new book in the in the uh, the other series right now. Yes. Uh, are you going to come back to Hope Early uh, after that? Or are we going to see more stories about her? Yes. In fact, um, in October 29th, the third book in the series, Three Widows and a Corpse, will be released, and I've just signed a contract for two more food blogger books. Oh, that is amazing. Yeah, um, yeah you, you're really on a on a, uh, uh, a publishing path that not a lot of authors uh, get to be on. A, a lot of times publishers will lock you know, a, a writer mm-hmm. into one book a year, and uh, it, it looks mm-hmm. like your publisher is really uh, meeting the demand for these books, which I think is fantastic. If if a writer can publish more, I think they they ought to uh, they right. ought to let them. You know, that's that's exactly. fantastic. Um, yeah, how is your relationship with the publisher, and do you do you guys have these kinds of conversations about how often a book ought to come out and and that sort of thing? Yeah, well. Um my, I love working with Kensington. Um, they're a great publisher. They, you know, the editing is wonderful, and the covers. I love my book covers. They're, I do too. They're fantastic. They're gorgeous, and I'm very fortunate. And yeah, you know, my publisher, my editor, you know, let me decide how many books that I actually wanted to to write a year. You know, I even though I write two books a year, they're two different series. I just did not want to get into the cycle of writing three books of the same series. You know, in a row. Um, to, that would have, I think, burnt me out. Um, so I like this pace. So they were very open to, you know, working with me as an individual, and I'm really grateful for that. That's great. Well, it, it keeps it fresh for the readers too. That uh, I think so. yeah, yeah, it kind of mix things up a bit. Uh, Deborah, if people are just learning about you and your work and all that you're doing, uh, where can they find you online and connect with you? Dig into your, you know, catalog and all that good mm-hmm. stuff. Well, they can visit me on my website, DeborahSenefelder.com. And I'm also on Facebook and Instagram. 
Excellent. I'm going to put links to all that stuff in the show notes at HankGarner.com. The Hidden Corpse, a food blogger mystery book, too, is out and available everywhere. Deborah, we're going to send everybody to see you and to pick up their copy of the book. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for taking time to come on the show today. I enjoyed it. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to HankGarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. No use crying over spilled milk. Eliza hated that cliché. She'd grown up a cliché. Her life a bowl of cherries, duck soup, easy as pie, child's play behind a white picket fence. Mother had been the Wyatt Earp of clichés, firing them off, quick draw. A rotten apple spoils the barrel. Smile and the world smiles with you. Every dog has his day. Children should be seen and not heard. She believed them all, particularly this last. Eliza obliged, preferring to wander the streets of Wytheville, Virginia, on her own lonesome terms. The divorce left Laura a spinster librarian and one false step on icy stairs left her an invalid as well. The accident happened on New Year's Eve, 1950. Laura had just locked the doors of Wytheville Public Library. We must make black-eyed peas tomorrow, Laura had been thinking, with turnip greens. That ensured a lucky New Year, and if you swept some money over your threshold, a prosperous one, too. She loved those old Southern traditions. She looked both ways, checking for negroes, but turned to heel on the icy marble of the stairs and fell into the bushes below, breaking the long bones in both legs. Eliza had taken advantage of her mother's absence. She'd lost her virginity that same night. She'd swept Ron Partridge over her threshold, initiating her own beloved tradition. She was nursing a hangover, giddily reliving the event, but around 8.30 she realized that her mother had not come down to breakfast. She checked her mother's bedroom, found it empty, took the bus down to the library, climbed the high stairs, knocked hard on the library doors, and heard a groan below. Laura lay under the William Penn barberry bushes, below the yellow-trimmed windows of the non-fiction section. Her white stockings ran Jezebel red with blood. Sweat and melted snow had soaked her blouse, and her gray forehead blazed. The broken bones didn't kill Laura Merrick. She lay in the hospital, wheezing, her legs mortared up in casts. She had few visitors after the first week. Her church group was glad to fret over a poor thing for a day or two, but they trickled away when Laura had the bad manners to linger. On Valentine's Day, as her mother slept, Eliza drew big, sloppy hearts on her casts. Laura harumphed when she woke and insisted on keeping her legs hidden beneath blankets afterwards. But in late March... Something miraculous happened. Laura's self-control dropped. She ranted at nurses, spit at doctors, swore like a Navy pilot dropping F-bombs on Hiroshima. She had dementia, the doctors said. Eliza decided that her mother had just stopped believing her own bullshit. The spells continued over the next two weeks, and Eliza enjoyed her mother's company for the first time. They swapped bawdy jokes, ogled the handsome interns, and chattered like best girlfriends late into the evening. They had long conversations, and Laura spoke her own mind in her own words about things that mattered to her. It broke Eliza's heart when the prim, condescending librarian returned. Laura hardly acknowledged anything that had passed between them. The clichés returned. You can't have your cake and eat it, too. A leopard doesn't change its spots. Nothing is certain except death and taxes. This last proved true. On April 15th, Laura Merrick marked her Bible with a tongue depressor, set it on her nightstand, leaned back against the headboard, and coughed blood down the front of her nightdress. Eliza found her that way, dead as the proverbial doornail, and yes, the blood was thicker than water, just as her mother had always said. Much thicker than water, in fact perhaps as thick as molasses in January.